Hello, welcome. In this video, I'm going to explain how the carburettor processes gasoline fuel in order for it to be combusted in the internal combustion engine. Because what I want to emphasize is that when air is drawn through the carburettor on its way into the engine, bringing with it gasoline fuel, it's not actually the gasoline fuel that we know it and see it as a liquid that can be used in the engine for combustion. So the fuel itself has to be specifically processed and that's the main function of all carburettors. And explaining that is what this video is all about. And everything will be summarised nicely at the end. And please could I ask you to give me your honest opinion on what you thought of this video and how it could have been improved. I will treat all comments as valuable constructive feedback and so please let me thank you now for doing this. Also, please feel free to request a video. So in order to explain how carburettors achieve this sort of processing on fuel, I'll have to explain some very basics on gasoline fuel chemistry. In other words, what it's made of. Now there are many other additives within gasoline that's put there to allow the gasoline to function the way it does. But with those chemicals aside, if we were to look at gasoline in its simplest form on its own, we'd see that each molecule of it has carbon atoms within it that are linked together very much like this by special bonds. Also bonded to each of the carbon atoms are hydrogen atoms, and so they surround the carbon atoms very much like this. But unlike a molecule of diesel fuel, which is shaped in more like a chain like this, the molecule of gasoline is more compact like this. It still consists of carbon and hydrogen, but it forms this slightly different structure. And because the molecule has got eight carbon atoms, it's denoted C8, and because it's got 18 hydrogen atoms, that's denoted as H18. And together, C8H18 is the chemical formula of gasoline fuel. And you'll find a link down below in the description of a reference to this. But liquid gasoline in the fuel tank doesn't exist as just one molecule, of course. There's literally billions and billions of them all together, making up the liquid itself. So let's have a look now why what these molecules are made of, as well as all being grouped together forming this liquid. Why it is that it's actually not so combustible inside the internal combustion engine. To explain this in basic terms, we'll need an engine. So we've got the engine cylinder, the cylinder head, the spark plug and the top of the piston at the bottom. And let's imagine that somehow gasoline in liquid form has got into the engine and it's lying here on top of the piston. And naturally of course we've got air above here that came in on the last induction stroke. And now the piston's rising on the compression stroke. And even though we've got a concentrated amount of gasoline molecules here, and that the air above has been compressed and generated heat as it should do. Both of those things, even in the presence of this spark from the spark plug, doesn't result in efficient combustion. And that's because the basic components of this liquid fuel are way too concentrated. All there is in there is the carbon atoms and the hydrogen atoms which form the gasoline molecules. And so the reason these molecules won't combust is because they're missing a vital component that needs to be integrated between them. It needs to be added in, not to form part of the molecules, but to exist in there separating the molecules. And that vital component is the oxygen from the air that the carburettor diligently adds to the gasoline fuel. So in essence, it's oxygen plus gasoline fuel plus a spark which creates combustion, all in the presence of a significant amount of compression in the internal combustion engine. So if that's the case, if oxygen's all we need now in order to make this fuel combust, then why doesn't the oxygen that's already in here, in the air that came in on the last induction stroke that's now being compressed, why doesn't the presence of that result in efficient combustion? Well, simply put, overall, there's not enough. As well as the need to have some in here in the air that's drawn in, the fuel also has to have oxygen giving air mixed in it as well. And this air is added in a special way by the special workings of the carburettor. But there's a solid concentration of fuel here with no air mixed in with it. And this of course means insufficient or in some cases may even mean no combustion at all. Let's have a look then at what makes good combustion. By looking very closely at a molecule of gasoline, we'll see how it goes through the combustion process. 
So in a good situation, this molecule of gasoline will exist there inside the engine with plenty of oxygen-rich air all around it. Of course, in the real situation, there'd be more than one molecule of fuel, and here, there'd be billions. And of course, they'd be too tiny to see with the naked eye. I'm just emphasising that the molecules of fuel need a good, rich supply of oxygen all around them. As the piston rises on the compression stroke, compressing the gasoline and the oxygen-rich air, there of course builds up a certain amount of pressure and heat as a result of that compression. So far, the gasoline has been able to withstand the heat generated by the compression pressure alone. But as the spark plug fires, that increases the heat in the molecule or the molecules closest to the spark. And that pushes the heat over and above what the gasoline molecule can withstand. And now, those special bonds that were holding the hydrogen and carbon atoms together, forming the gasoline molecule, break due to the increased heat. And the breaking of these bonds themselves releases a large amount of heat energy. And this heat goes on to affect the gasoline molecules closest to it. It breaks their bonds and they produce heat. And this happens to the molecules closest to that. And this continues as what we would see as a wave of flame inside the cylinder, engulfing the whole of the inside space and forcing the piston down as the heat causes expansion of the gases. And left behind is a reconfiguration of molecules that we know as exhaust gases. So in essence, it's the breaking of these gasoline molecule bonds that we know as the explosion of combustion. And as we saw instantly after this took place, Place, these atoms then rebonded and created new molecules as exhaust gas molecules. So the difference being that the carbon atoms bond with two atoms of oxygen. So showing it in its chemical formula, we've got the C for the carbon and we've got two oxygen atoms. And this is of course CO2, carbon dioxide. And it's the first bit here in dioxide, the di, that's just another word for two, basically meaning two oxygen atoms. And the other molecule that's been constructed consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So the chemical formula for this is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, that's H2O, which is of course water. So it's carbon dioxide and water, that's the product of combustion, and on the exhaust stroke these gases are emitted out through the exhaust. Of course the water produced as a result of all of this doesn't come flooding out of the exhaust as a liquid, it comes out with the exhaust gases more like a steam. So what I've just explained is complete combustion. That's when everything's going well, when there's enough oxygen and the chemical processes that are occurring are favouring a great combustion. And so let's have a look how that differs from incomplete combustion, where there's a state of not enough oxygen available. So in this instance, where there is a certain amount of oxygen, of course, up here in the air that was drawn in in the induction stroke, and this now being compressed and creating heat, the important thing to consider is that this concentrated blanket of gasoline is lying there on top of the piston as a layer of liquid. And because liquid is virtually incompressible, there won't be as much heat generated within this liquid as there is above here in the air. So the fluid will be cooler. And that means even though there's the heat of compression and the spark, which would usually take the heat to a point where the gasoline is reactive, because in this instance the gasoline doesn't hold as much heat, there isn't enough heat to push over that threshold to make all of that gasoline combust. And I'm talking about incomplete combustion here, not no combustion. So there is going to be some of this fuel combusted, but just not all of it the way we've seen previously. So there's going to be different chemical reactions going on inside the cylinder, and there's going to be different exhaust gases produced as a result of less oxygen giving air around the gasoline. I'm not saying no oxygen because there wouldn't be any combustion at all. I'm saying less oxygen. So in this instance, following combustion, first of all, there's going to be some gasoline molecules still in intact in here. And that's because, as we've already seen, the heat didn't get high enough inside the cylinder to affect a lot of those gasoline molecules and break the bonds between the atoms that make them. And so, in essence, there's still unburnt gasoline inside the cylinder with the exhaust gases. And of course, if there's uncombusted gasoline left inside here, combustion itself wouldn't have been as large and effective as it should have been. And we know this is going to have an effect on the power and efficiency of the engine. As well as still having these unused gasoline molecules in there, some of them of course that would have had better exposure to the heat would have been combusted as we established so there'll be some carbon dioxide as a result of that. Because there's a lack of oxygen, we'll tend to find that some carbon atoms are only bound to one oxygen. And the chemical formula for this is just what it's shown as, CO. 
So like always, we've got the C here, representing the carbon, and then this time, instead of dioxide, it's monoxide. Mon, from the word mono, which means one, so one oxygen. At the same time, as a result of incomplete combustion, carbon atoms can exist inside here without anything bound to them, so they're hanging around there on their own. Again, simply because there's not enough oxygen atoms to bound to them. And it's these free carbon atoms that can be seen in the exhaust smoke as black soot. The hydrogen atoms will always bind to the oxygen to make water molecules and we can see now the products of incomplete combustion. We've got the deadly carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. There's still water produced, but now there's free carbons as soot. But it's important to note that your average internal combustion engine doesn't combust fuel absolutely, completely and perfectly. But the more perfectly it does so, of course, the better. So we can see that it's essential for efficient running of the engine to produce a situation where there is as complete combustion as we can possibly get. And it's the job of the good old carburetor to make sure that there's enough oxygen available for the gasoline to allow a combustion that's as complete as possible. And it does that by adding in oxygen rich air into the fuel in specific amounts at specific points as it transforms the liquid fuel into a more combustible form. Okay, so in order to explain how the carburetor transforms this liquid gasoline fuel into a form that's combustible by the engine, I will have to explain how the carburetor's induction tube works. So when air is drawn into the induction tube on its way into the engine, it of course passes this restriction in the venturi, which I'll explain a little more about in a minute. But after it's done so, it's important to mention that the air on both sides of this restriction is moving at a exactly the same speed. That's providing that the tube on this side is the same size and carries the same volume of air as it does on this side. But there may well be some differences between these two sides on some carburettors, but just let's say for now that they're both the same so I can explain my point that little bit better. But if we look at the amount of air coming into the induction tube, there's a certain volume of it because of how thick this pipe is on this side, which is exactly the same as this side in this model. How is it that this whole volume of air this side can move through this narrowing and allow the air to move at the same speed this side. How can it possibly carry that much volume to support that speed here? Well, the way it does that is that when the air goes through the restriction here, its velocity increases. Basically, it speeds up faster than these two areas, and that allows it to feed that volume of air from this side to this side, allowing the air in these two areas to move at the same speed. And because the energy of this high velocity air is focused on going towards the engine rather than pushing outwards, there's a decrease of pressure in this direction here, and it will become apparent in a few minutes why that's important. But from here, there are four main causes for how fuel is drawn up into the carburetor and is successfully processed in order for the engine to combust it. And the first one is that because the engine has to pull such a large volume of air through this restriction in order to feed it with all the air that it needs, it has to build up quite a strong suction pressure. And so this side of the restriction tends to have a higher vacuum. And it's this vacuum that helps to pull out fuel out of the main jet. And as we established a few minutes ago, because there's low pressure here inside this restriction, there's little or no pressure pushing down on the fuel this way. So it's easily drawn out by the vacuum and into the inlet tube. But as I've already mentioned, the fuel entering the inlet tube from the main jet doesn't come out as a liquid as we know it, because this form can't be combusted by the engine. So instead, it comes out partially separated by air. So the fuel goes through what's called an emulsification process within the main jet even before it comes out into the induction tube. And the way it does this is about how air enters the carburetor. As the suction pressure caused by the engine draws it through the air filter and into the induction tube, it also sends it down a separate channel way connected to the main jet. Looking at the main jet a little closer, we can see that there's a series of penetrating holes in the side. In this main jet, from a Briggs & Stratton carburetor, those holes can be seen clearly. And accompanying this main jet is a cover which fits over these holes, like this. And now to see how this system works, let's imagine we can see through the cover. And what we'd usually 
clearly see is a seal up at the top here stopping any pressure going upwards. And what pressure exactly am I referring to? Well it's the air pressure from that specialised pipe we looked at a few minutes ago. And so as the air floods in the cover allows it to flow down the outside of the main jet and in through the holes. And so as the engine runs and it's drawing liquid fuel as we know it up the main jet, the air that enters through these holes is at a pressure that allows it to force its way in to that liquid fuel, thus mixing with it. And it's this mix of air and fuel here that's referred to as the fuel being emulsified. And it's this area of the main jet that's known as the emulsification tube. And even though the general well-known definition of emulsification is the dispersion of one liquid into another, this is still known as emulsification, even though it's not two liquids. It's air and a liquid, so air and fuel. And so after this process has taken place, the emulsified fuel is drawn out of the main jet into the inlet of the carburetor, ready for the final part of the fuel processing before it can be used by the engine. And it's vital, by the way, that the fuel is mixed with air at this point, because with four-stroke engines that don't have fuel-air mixture screws like on small type chainsaws and two-stroke engines, where we can manually lean up the fuel making a better air to fuel ratio. It's important that the fuel is already lean in order for there to be a decent complete combustion of the fuel in the engine. Not too lean of course, but just lean enough for things to run correctly. And so that's what the emulsification tube is all about. Taking a liquefied form of fuel and emulsifying it, making it less concentrated and more lean by separating those gasoline molecules as we've looked at. And to begin the next part of the fuel separation process, which is atomization. And for that we need high velocity air. And as the air in the centre of the restriction is travelling at high velocity and the fact that the exit of the main jet is right on or near the area of the restriction, this high velocity air hits the emulsified fuel so hard this is what's known as atomizing it. It's spread the fuel out even further into small particles between all of that air. Now the fuel is separated enough with enough air between it looking more like a mist at this point than a fluid that when it enters the engine it can combust efficiently. So the four main ways that a carburetor processes fuel in order to make it into a form that's combustible by the engine are vacuum, low pressure, fuel emulsification and high velocity air. And so I hope that's helped give you a better understanding of what goes on inside a carburetor and why it goes on. And this is how these systems work to the best of my knowledge and beliefs over the years I've been researching and repairing carburetors. So I want to thank you so much for watching the whole video. It's took me a long time to put it together but you've shown your appreciation for my time spent for watching it through to the end. And so if just you alone have found something here interesting or valuable that will help you along the way then for me making this video has been more than worth it. So I want to thank you so much again. Here are some more videos that might help you further. Please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already and I'll be back soon. Thank you for watching.